that. Uh, Nikhil, take it away for us. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Columbia Leaders Experience. My name is Nikhil Vasan. I graduated from Columbia in 2009, did a master's in computer science from CS. Uh, and uh, Columbia Leaders Experience, as you know, has been on since October. It's into its last week now. And uh, I'm sure most of you would have uh, attended several sessions that uh, are designed to <clears throat> to provide leadership development amongst all alumni leaders. Uh, and I'm a part of the associations and clubs Kale subcommittee, uh, which consists of 20 alumni leaders like me from all over the world. And we've worked very closely to make sure that all these events are a success over the last five weeks and this uh, final week. So we thank you for your volunteering and leadership with CAA across the world, across all the regional alumni clubs and uh, other clubs in different cities. Uh, yeah. uh, do I have control? Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, so as you know, this is the final week of uh, Kale, and we have some exciting uh, events coming up. So on Thursday, we have a trivia night, uh, which is being hosted exclusively by CAA Singapore. Uh, 14th uh, Saturday is the final, uh, it's the closing day. So we have uh, our president, Lee Bollinger, who will be, uh, <coughs> who will be in one of the events. Then we have uh, the Honorable Madeleine K. Albright, uh, who is a former US Secretary of State. We have Lisa Carnoy, who is a university trustee. Uh, on 21st, we have another uh, trivia night, and this is exclusively being hosted by the Columbia University Club of London. So, so quite a few upcoming events, which I would encourage all of you to join and register for. And uh, today we have, uh, so I would like to introduce you to our speakers for this session. We have uh, Graciela and uh, Lucia. So Graciela is a journalist and a translator with a master's of arts from Columbia Journalism School. She graduated in 2008. Uh, she currently works as a freelance reporter covering Chile for uh, foreign media outlets, including Televisa, TRT World, France 24, and Red Intelligence. As a translator, she worked for the Italian publishing group. Uh, it's called So 24 Or. She's also worked as a reporter for Dow Jones uh, and the Financial Times Group in New York City. She graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts from uh, her hometown, which is, I'm sorry, I'm unable to pronounce this, uh, but uh, it's Bina Del Mar. I'm, I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, she's also the president and co-founder of CAA Chile. And she has a passion for community building, languages, traveling and cooking, uh, which she mastered during the stay at home order in Chile due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Lucia graduated from Columbia College in 2008. She began her career in asset management at BlackRock. And then following a five year tenure at BlackRock, she co-founded a social media marketing technology company called Swerve. Uh, which was ultimately acquired. She is now working for another startup based in Paris. Uh, it's called uh, Hiverbrite. And uh, this is a SaaS enterprise engagement software. It's focused on the US international operation expansion. And she's very passionate about providing access to mentoring and capital, especially to minority groups. And has spent a lot of time over the years working with and mentoring other female founders. Uh, Lucia is an active volunteer in the NYC ecosystem and with NYC Cares. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Graciela. Um, hi, Nico. Nico, thank you for the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, in Spanish, we have this N, the N with um, the sign on the top. <laughs> okay, sorry, yeah, I could not pronounce. Uh, it's it's well, always hard for, for some people yeah. to, to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, how did I get involved into Colombia Alumni Club of Chile? 
um, as Nikhil say, I uh, graduated in 2008 from the journalism school. And after I graduated, I um, stayed in New York City for three years. I came back to Santiago, Chile's capital in 2011. And as soon as I came back, I realized like um, that, that I, all the conversations my friends, my family were having, I felt like I wasn't fitting into. They were talking things too local and I was missing New York City where I would talk with my friends about uh, the Arab Spring or what was going on in Europe and, and global um, subjects like this one. So I reached out to my um, Chilean friends who had been at Colombia while I was there too. And um, I started uh, meeting them and, and going out with them. And we realized we have uh, a lot in common beyond being Chileans. We had um, gone to uh, one of the best universities in the world and we had lived in, uh, for me, the best city in the world, New York City. So all of this experience was, um, had shaped us. And we talked about um, meeting other alumni and maybe forming some type of um, association. We didn't know there was this um, Columbia Alumni um, Association in New York with, with uh, all these clubs around the world that we later um, got to know. And uh, we, we started uh, with a friend with one of them. I'm gonna share here a presentation with some photos. Uh, so here it is. With, um, Pilar Duarte, she's, uh, she, she graduated from the law school in 2001. We started organizing informal events, happy hours. Uh, and the goal was to, um, to have fun. Just meet fellow graduates and have fun, uh, relax, enjoy. And, um, and we organized a couple of happy hours in 2014 and 2015. Uh, then we were in touch with um, CIA and Elisa Douglas was our contact there and she would send the invitations for us. And at the end of 2015, Pilar uh, committed suicide and it was very sad for me, for everyone. I was shocked and uh, I mean, she was always the, the rock, a very strong person. I, I was always uh, wondering, nobody's gonna come to our events. We don't have enough RSVP and she would say like, uh, even if we're five people, we're gonna have fun, so relax um, and just enjoy this. And so after she she passed, um, she died, um, I said, I'm not gonna organize more events, this is too sad. And then in 2016, I, I moved to Milano in Italy and, um, and I talked to a, a Brazilian friend, she was also a graduate from Colombia. She was living in Santiago at the time. And I said to her like, uh, do you want to organize an event while I'm gone? And she said, yes, I can do it. And so she organized a visit to a museum and, uh, and then she sent me pictures and I saw 10 people all looked like they were having a lot of fun. And then I said like, maybe I can do it. I can, I can organize events on my own too. So I came back in 2017 and um, with other, um, and I started organizing happy hours or visit to museums and then happy hours, one or two a year, one or, or two times a year. And I met other um, alumni and I asked them, do you wanna do this? Uh, do you wanna uh, participate in this and maybe form a club? And a couple of them said yes. And then uh, Juan Somaria, an alumnus from SIPA, he uh, talked to me and said, we should form a club formally formalize this, what we have. And I said, okay, but we need four people. That was Elisa, that was what Elisa Douglas was telling me, you need four people to form a club because otherwise it's a lot of work. And he said, well, I'll organize a, a dinner at home and um, at my place and I'll invite some people who could help in this. And you can invite the people you've known that who would also like to help. And so I said, yes. And we had this dinner and this was January, 2018. And, um, and we decided to formalize the club. And, and one alumnus said, I'll do a Facebook page. And the other one said, um, I'll organize a visit to the subway uh, because I work at the Santiago subway. 
and and that's how we started and since since then uh we've organized a number of events i mean this is a visit to a park near santiago uh we try to include friends and family because we want to build a community um here's a visit to the central bank of chile in santiago um where we learn about monetary policy and also about the building's architecture. It's an old building, as you can see. We also visited the Stock Exchange in Santiago. It's also an old building. And then we organize happy hours every year um, in the summer, in our summer. And uh, these are very popular because we always get new people there especially the, the people who had just moved back to Chile, they are always there. So it's, it's a great um, opportunity to meet them and to try to include them in the, in the club and, and try to, to uh, make them a volunteer. And here's the group, the team. Some of them are now board members of the club and uh, we meet uh, four times a year. We do a dinner. This year we've only done it once in January before COVID. Um, hit Chile, and uh, we keep trying, uh, we, we always have fun, and, and that's always our main goal, because if you have fun, everyone else is going to have fun. So now, um, Lucia um, from Colombia Women's Business Society alumni um, is going to uh, talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Graciela. Thank you so much for um, for passing it over and um, so hard to contend with all those incredibly fun photos. Uh, I'm so, I don't have as many fun photos, but I will share the story of how the Columbia Women's Business Study alumni has come to fruition and then later share a little bit more about how we actually uh, think about the sustainability of our board and, and succession planning. But first, as it pertains a bit to how our organization was formed. It was formed and founded in 2017. Uh, we work closely liaisoning with Jenna in its formation and growth. I would say that the organization came through as a need um, of itself, where similarly there was after, after Columbia, I spent some time in finance and was looking to actually make a switch into the technology industry. And when I was trying to make that switch, I realized just how my how much my network was actually mostly of those and other individuals in finance. And so I looked back to kind of tap into some other networks where I could find diversity. Um, and Columbia was was one of those networks. And so through conversations I had had with other Columbia alumni and mentors, I came to find opportunity and a opportunity presented itself uh, in, in technology and entrepreneurship and startup realm. And that got me thinking about, well, I wish there was some sort of way to more easily connect with alumni, alumni like me, who want to be um, more inter interdisciplinary in nature, continue to enhance their education and interplanetary studies, to meet and network with other women, um, and beyond in different uh, in different sectors and segments. And so I reached back out to some of the women with whom I had participated in the Columbia Women's Business Society undergraduate institution to ask them if they were experiencing some of those same needs and wants and they said yes. And so in 2017, we uh, formed a, sm uh, a small board uh, to actually begin the alumni society, so Columbia Women's Business Society alumna. And I'll just share with you a quick uh, share of our mission and values. I would say that the, uh, the alumni organization is open uh, for all schools as well as, oops, present, open for all schools. Um, and we're really looking to empower connections among the thriving alumni of Columbia University, make sure we can establish a successful network of leaders and business across all industries. So of course, as a SIG, uh, we are open to alumni from all the schools um, and become really a driving force in creating a positive impact in both our workplace and our community. And I 
have been able to attend a variety of events through the organization in which I've really expanded my network beyond finance and tech and consulting and into meeting people across the board from engineers to scientists to people who work in medicine, et cetera. And I've loved that. And I think that's one of the things that really draws people to our organization, just the diversity aspect of it. Here's our current board. So myself, Caroline and Aurora, it is a small and lean team. And we try to get quite a bit done with that team. And I can talk a little bit more about that um, in the next segment of our conversation. But before I do, I just want to share a little bit more about the goals of our organization and how we think about building our community and continuing to grow that community to foster our mission. And so we think about member adoption and member engagement and member retention. And within that, we think about ways in which we can cultivate more individuals because the Columbia women community is quite large and across the globe. So how do we think about bringing, bringing those individuals in? We really think about uh, co-sponsoring events uh, and content with other SIGs and other regional groups. Uh, so that's one and creating um, combined events. We think about also how do we um, bring on as undergraduates graduate uh, and become alumni? How do we think about bringing them um, as alumni into our organization and, and encourage them to become volunteers as well as how do we stay active with undergrads so consistently working with uh, the right leaders on campus as students to bring together events where alumni and students can engage. So that's how we work with adoption. In terms of engagement, we typically like to have a different amount of events throughout the year, anywhere from six to 10, although of course COVID has changed that um, a little bit in terms of in-person versus online, but we like to think about having about six to 10 events a year and three different themes in those events. So skill set building, events, uh, continuing education uh, events or social happy hour types of events because we of course want to have fun, but we know from doing a multitude of surveys that our members are also uh, interested in uh, spaces where they can talk about certain concepts or in business or issues that they might be having, as well as improving skill sets. So for example, last year we had done a survey the year before and we realized that there was a lot of individuals interested in it in really improving negotiation skill sets. And so we actually hosted a whole series of events around negotiation skill sets, both to focus on that skill set and its improvement, but also generally how to talk about negotiation, continuing our education around it, why it's important, how things might we want might want to change the discussion around this, as well as doing some happy hours with it. So we, we have different types of uh, events that maybe are series depending on feedback that we get, trying to bring together different content um, to help with engagement as well. So identifying quarterly newsletter content, different types of podcasts, events, volunteering, job postings. A lot of times we see community members are looking to recruit other Columbia alumna uh, or alumni and, uh, or, and or have volunteering opportunities. So we try to bring that to the community and find those types of uh, content get a lot of engagement. And then of course, in terms of making sure that we continue to kind of keep our members engaged over the long term, uh, doing annual surveys to help those members um, really share with us what it is that they're interested in and um, keep keeping the content and events fresh and relevant uh, for, for members and understanding to the diversification of members. So there might be members who are older or younger, different stages. They might actually have different needs and wants in terms of uh, maybe family style events, uh, maybe happy hour style events, maybe different times in their career. So we think about all of those things as well when we get that feedback. I will now pass it back over to Graciela um, to talk about a specific thematic uh, for uh, as the Chilean organization has grown. Um, so I'm handing it back to you. Thank you, Lucia. Um, now it's the hard part, <laughs> how to engage um, new leaders. So let me share again my screen. Okay, it's just one slide this time. Um, how to develop and mentor alumni leaders. So um, first we think we have to have fun, as I said before, because if you're having fun, everyone is having fun and then many good things will come out of it. 
um, people get connections, they make friends, um, ideas come out and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, good things and, and unknown things come out of this. Uh, then uh, user resources. This I learned in um, Columbia Alumni Leaders Weekend in 2018. I attended different panels and um, one alumni leader was saying, uh, use your resources, which means um, knowing your base, your alumni base and, and reaching out to, to each one for, for a specific thing. For example, now we're working on bylaws and uh, we talked to an alumnus from the law school and he's working on the bylaws. And he's been involved in this. And, and as he's been involved, he's, he's learned more about the club and about the board. And um, I, I asked him, like, when, when all of this is done, we need to have elections. Would you like to be a candidate um, to be a board member? And he said, yes, count me in. Um, then we have another alumna who is a videographer. She also graduated from the journalism school. And I, ask her to do some things with video. So that's things where they can help and they can get to know more um, the club and eventually become leaders. Then <coughs> rely on Columbia Alumni Association and other alumni clubs. Um, Columbia Alumni Association has been helpful um, to us, um, all the people who work there, uh, they have a lot of experience, um, Paul, um, Jenna, Nick, and before them, um, uh, Elisa and Langin, and also now Yolanda. Um, they've been very helpful and, and in helping us with like small things to big things to, to ideas we can do, um, guidelines. So uh, we try to rely, I try to rely on them and, and ask them for advice when I need it. Also, there are other clubs that you uh, may feel you have a connection or are in a similar situation. For example, uh, in Santiago, there is a global centers and there's also a global centers in Paris. So I talked to the president of the France club and um, he said they try to organize events that are different than the ones or global centers organize. And we try to do the same here. So we've been focused more on outdoors event, um, visit to museums, happy hours, uh, or, or if any alumnus has an idea of like, hey, we should visit the subway, like it happened two years ago, we do that. Or um, I can do a presentation on the architecture of the homes in Chile. We did this online this year, that was another event we organized. So, um, you may find you have some clubs that are similar to you and it's always good to talk to them. And, and you get to know all, all these other clubs through the quarterly calls. So um, that's, that's also something that we've been trying to do and, and talk to other club leaders. Now we're working on bylaws. Uh, this has been the whole year we've been working on this and this has taken a lot of our energy. So. We've had to sacrifice some events, like Zoom events. We've, we've done just two or three events on Zoom. Um, and last year we did uh, 10 events a year, I think, in, in person events. And this year we had only two events in person and maybe three events on Zoom. So, because we've been working on, on bike laws, um, and this is uh, so if you want, you want to attract new leaders, they, they need to know what they can do and bylaws is, is good for that because um, they'll say what each, um, what the board members uh, are required to do and then how long will they be board members and, and what's the, what are the goals of the club, the mission and it gives a formality to the club. And then also you're building a legacy and um, when you're gone, I mean, all the new leaders uh, will have a base on how to project the club into the future. Into the future. And all, all of this is, um, we, try to be, we are trying to build a community. Uh, we invite friends and family to our events so they, they feel they, they are part of a group, part of a family. And, and that's also a way of engaging them and then eventually having them as leaders. 
uh, but it's still always <laughs> something challenging and um, sometimes we lose good leaders and uh, have to go and try and look for new leaders and uh, but we'll see we'll have elections next year when we have the bylaws finalized and and we'll see how all of this has worked so thank you lucia thank you so much all right i'm going to talk a little bit about board recruitment and succession planning as i am sure um, we have all had both uh, wonderful experiences and also challenges in terms of recruiting um, volunteers, um, maybe sustainability of board and board members, maybe in individuals who perhaps have fallen off boards um, and uh, needing to fill seats and or not being able to kind of find the new successors for the board. So I wanted to share a few tips and tricks that we have found useful on our board, especially as we also think about the right succession planning for uh, the, next, uh, the next leaders for CWBSA. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Uh, so you can just see two quick slides on some about four tricks that I think or tips that have really uh, been influential for us. So the first I would say is um, really have a structure and to the board. And I think that what we have started to see is when we've created a more structure, and I'll talk to you about some key bullet points here to help put together structure. We have found that leaders really emerge from within the base that end up shining and want to give more. Um, and from a result of that, we end up seeing them becoming uh, consistent board members and leaders for the organization. So the first I would say that we found to be very helpful is to, within the community, build out our kind of volunteer and champion network. So what I mean by this is leaving space and opportunity for members to assist in events, become speakers, participate in one-off or smaller engagement activities. And from this, what we started to see are some individuals raise their hand, wanting to participate in an event or participate in helping uh, maybe put together some content for us. And from that, we start to see trickles of volunteers that end up becoming more consistent, that are regularly attending events, regularly asking to be volunteers or to help in some way. And from there, uh, eventually providing more opportunity for them to perhaps run an event themselves with us, with our, uh, with our board supporting. Uh, or do take ownership over some activity. So that's one way we start to see those kind of what we call champions emerge. The other is really thinking about the clear expectations that we expect from our members versus our volunteers versus our board members. So all of our members, we we're hoping that they will engage with our organization, um, participate, um, in some way, either by attending events or by engaging with some content that we're creating. But the expectation still of members is kind of to be um, perhaps there. We would love for them to engage, but most of our members are sort of passive actors on a day to day basis. Um, our volunteers, though, these are individuals have raised their hands and have actually said that they're interested in speaking or being um, connected with other individuals for advice giving, or they would like to participate actively in some way and maybe on, even on a consistent basis. Um, and then board members, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the expectation for board members, but board members are understood to have certain expectations in terms of attendance of board uh, meetings and the types of activities that we would like for them to do. Um, and, and we'll get into that in a moment. So here, it's really thinking about what's establishing that clear path to becoming a board member and leaving space for that growth. So people either participating in events, being accountable for their volunteering activities. And then uh, we've even uh, tested out and it's worked very well, someone who becomes kind of an interim pre-board member where there are certain activities that they fulfill. Um, and then once we've seen that they, uh, maybe if they wanna be events chair for, um, or communications chair, see that they've done you know, some really great work on a quarterly newsletter or really great work on an event or two, 
we then um, say we would love to add you to the board. The other is um, keeping board meetings really regular and documented. So we actually have uh, bi-monthly cadences for our board meetings and we set the tone really for consistency. And the nice thing is it really creates kind of a community within our community because we invite volunteers also to our board meetings, advisors, or we might also invite to our board meetings if we're having a, a special speaker for the speaker to come and meet the board. And the board in this way, um, becomes and the volunteers too can become um, a community within a community they become very connected we know quite a bit about each other we're really building strong relationships with our board members and so that tone um, is a very very positive tone we end up having catch-ups even if it's just 15 minutes echoing a lot of what Graciela said at the end of the day, I really enjoy our board meetings as much as our events because I get to have fun with people who I now consider friends. Um, and so that really keeps the board exciting and alive and people want to come to our meetings and really feel discouraged when they can't. Um, so that keeps uh, the board really fun outside of all the events that we do um, as well. And then something um and and of course each board member then understands because it's pretty clear if you're events chair if you're ex the expectations of what it means to be on the board outside of just attending our board meetings regularly um, when we're doing events or we're doing any type of other engagement what how and when they're participating and what that expectation is and really keeping board members accountable um, for that and so usually there is self-regulation but sometimes that accountability um, does need to come in, into play. And I'm sure all of us as leaders have experienced this as well. What happens when volunteers or board leaders kind of drop off, um, maybe for professional or pers personal reasons, they no longer have the time, the resources to be able to commit uh, the work uh, that they can essentially uh, commit to for uh, being a board member or boring, being an advisor or being a volunteer. Um, so first and foremost, again, it's important that um, their expectations are clearly set and communicated before either they become that volunteer or board member, um, and that there's open dialogue, people understand, we all know we're all volunteers and have very, very busy lives, so if you cannot dedicate that time, totally understand, but it's really important to communicate that. I myself have had actually a board member or two just fall off and I've never heard from them again. And I ended up actually meeting them at my 10 year reunion uh, only to ask them what happened, <laughs> um, which was a very interesting story. And the, the learning for me is to try to leave as much space as possible for people to feel very comfortable with you and let you know that, um, okay, I really do understand all these expectations, but um, now I have something changed in my life. I've had a child, I've changed my job, and I just no longer can dedicate the hours, the time that I need to dedicate in order to do that. So um, leaving again that path from becoming a member to a volunteer to a board leader, making sure that it's very clear, what does it mean to be all of those things? And then once you become one, making it, uh, making it continuous and documented, the board meetings, keeping them fun, keeping everybody like building a relationship with each one of the board members really does help. And so when it's then time to do your succession, when leaders are um, going to turn over, you can naturally find those leaders through individuals who have actually been very active already in either events or other other activities that you've been you've been doing, and every year we also actually create a um, new survey to see what people want, uh, what kind of feedback they would like to give us, as well as uh, is there any other type of volunteering opportunity that you did not have uh, the opportunity to work with us this year, but you would like to. So outside of you know becoming a speaker or working on an event? Are there any other ways that you would like to become, become involved and become a volunteer? So we try to add that as well in the survey every year so we can continuously get new uh, volunteers into that funnel and work them up into board, uh, board members. And the only thing, uh, other thing I would say is 
um, never get discouraged and have a lot of positivity and energy because yes, we're all volunteers and we're giving back more time and I love that. And sometimes we just have to have patience with certain volunteers or board leaders who for many, many reasons, they just aren't able to give the way that they wanted to give. And so again, be really open about that and be prepared um, to make sure that you have the other individuals in the pipeline who you can kind of move up into those positions um, when, when that does happen. And I am going to now turn it back over uh, to the floor. I'm um, to, I can't recall, I think at this point we might be doing questions. Is that right? So I'll turn it back to the floor then. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucia and Graziella for those uh, wonderful remarks and for your insights. I think you've, you've both definitely seen, seen a lot of success over, over a fairly short period of time and you've been able to really build uh, within your communities. Um, at this time, I just wanted to, as Lucia said, open the floor to see if anybody has any questions um, for either Graziella or Lucia, um, anybody who's been in a position to start or formalize an organization, I think these, these two wonderful leaders can certainly share a lot. If anybody wants to share any experiences they've had in similar situations. I'd love to hear if there's anyone that has thoughts on succession planning or ways in which to keep board members kind of motivated and active. I'm always really in search and interested to hear how, how other leaders and, and other um, groups do it. So I, I've spent a considerable amount of time in, in India. I was, I've been leading the Delhi club for almost eight or nine years. And initially we did elections. So, so when I went back to Delhi in 2009, uh, I don't think there was a club at that time. Then a couple of alumni leaders, they started a club in 2010. So 2010, 2011, they were leading the club. And then in 2012, we had elections. And that is when we, that is when I uh, started leading the club. And after that, we've never really had elections. So we've been toying with the idea of having elections, but for some reason, we've never been able to have it in, in India. And India is structured in a very different way as compared to other uh, countries. So we have five or six cities over there. Each city is a chapter in itself. It's not a club. And the entire country, uh, India is considered as one club and then each city is considered as a chapter. So uh, we've, we've struggled with elections, basically. That's, that's the point that I'm coming to. We've struggled with trying to organize and hold elections in India. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really know the, the reason. Is it because uh, we don't have the momentum or we don't know how to organize elections over there? Or uh, it's just that uh, it's too tough or too difficult to organize? So I'm not sure, but this is my observation. We haven't been able to do it for almost a decade. Thanks, Nikhil, for, for sharing that. I see um, uh, Mariam has asked a question in the chat. Do you want to ask your question out loud or do you want me to just read your question? <laughs> I guess I can go out loud. Hi, everybody. First of all, Tia and Graciela, these were Tremendously helpful. Um, thank you guys for sharing your insight into how do we develop leaders and how do we make more cohesive units. Uh, my question to either of you really is, how do you go about dealing with board members who may have become unresponsive or MIA for longer stretches of time while still being respectful of the fact that they might have something going on in their personal lives? Um, even though you just haven't heard from them in a while, you just wanna check in, make sure they're okay. Uh, and if they need to take time away, then that's fine. But how do you go about doing so? Sure, I can, I can take that and Graciela, feel free um, to also add. I think um, echoing some of, the, some of the kind of tips that I had provided prior, um, one thing that I, I had forgotten to mention is that 
we also make it very clear that there's a certain amount of um, board meetings that uh, cannot go unmissed. Otherwise, um, we would um, uh, we would expect to hear from you if you do have to miss a board meeting in two consecutive sessions. Um, and if you go MIA after two consecutive sessions, there is the um, ability for us to kind of turn over your position. So it's just clear that everyone knows that up front um, and that that's kind of the expectation that we set um, with people who come in. And before I will say, I actually did experience twice members going MIA. One eventually came back after two months and the other one never came back. So I think that was a good learning and what it had helped me to, to really think through and the board at the time to think through was making sure we set up um, like an expectation and accountability for individuals to, um, to attend that, that bi-monthly uh, meeting that we have. And if you don't attend for those two sessions, then we're going to assume that you can no longer, and, and we haven't heard from you, of course. You haven't attended and we have not heard from you. That would basically be in a month. Um, then we would have the ability to kind of turn over that position and respectfully, we usually write a note saying per, um, you know, per, uh, per the bylaws, et cetera, uh, we would ask that uh, you have communicated to us uh, within this period as you have not, and you've not uh, attended any of the sessions that we would assume that you're, um, that you no longer wish to hold this role within the organization. And um, if, if you do at some point want to return, et cetera, please, uh, please let us know and we're happy to, to have that discussion with you uh, with you again. And since we've actually put that in place, um, we actually haven't lost anyone. Uh, I don't know if that's just good luck or <laughs> um, but that's how we that's how we have have uh, been able to broach that topic. Well that's great to know Lucia um, <laughs> your, your policy regarding um, missing board members. Um, we, we, the Chile Club has, uh, we are still in the process of formalizing, but um, the initial group who we started this two, three years ago now, nearly three years ago, uh, some of them has, uh, I've seen they are not, they, they stopped participating after a while and I asked them what was going on and um, there were two women and they were saying like, they were having a lot of things to do with um, with their jobs and then their families. And, and so they didn't want to continue in this. I said, okay, because I wanted to put um, on the webpage the name of all the board members. So I'm not going to put you in, in, in that. And they were okay with it. And now there's um, a guy who is being a little bit missing also. Um, with COVID, he, um, his job changed and he has a lot of more work. And um, that's why I feel he stopped participating in the meetings. And I have to talk to him um, what's going on. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, we're almost the end of the year. Uh, if we finalize the bylaws this year, we can have elections in March or April next year. So I don't know if it uh, will make a big difference. Um, but, but still, I would like to talk to him and, and ask him what's going on. It's always better to ask and, and then they might say, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. I, and then you, you know you can't count on that person and you, you look for someone else. Lucia, I have sort of a follow-up question about your bylaws, just the policy that you kind of just stated. Is that can you send me the language that you put in your bylaws? We're in the process in SoCal of like re revising our bylaws. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that we've included anything specifically about meeting attendance um, because we get a lot of hemming and hawing about how like how much of a waste of people's time meetings can be. And we're also busy and all these things. Um, so I would love to. <laughs> Just kind of see the language and how, um, because we often do have people not attend and also not communicate, and that is very frustrating, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to share it. And also a part of it, I think that we just have also gotten really lucky with this. It's a very, as you saw in my presentation, there's only three of us and that's, it, it, it does. I know that there are other groups that have much larger teams. And I think that um, the three of us now have been able to form a very strong bond, which has helped in making sure that individuals have not really gone MIA, but I know as we look to find additional board members or some succession in the board as it turns, it'll be really important. Um, it'll be really important to, to ultimately continue to have that community, that camaraderie, um, because outside of just it being, you know, something that we, we expect, and that's like a bylaw, I think it's also people want to attend, right? And they actually are very discouraged if they can't. So <laughs> Um, that's another thing that that it's important as well. But yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions or experiences they want to share? Um, this is uh, the last of the kale programs being a uh, planned by the, uh, for our regional club and shared interest group leaders. So if anyone wants to share anything that they've learned over the past five or so weeks, any major takeaways, we are uh, excited to hear about them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I want to thank you, um, all of you at um, CAA for organizing this event uh, where we can share um, each, each one's experience and see some similarities. I, I see there um, some comments from Marian. Um, she says um, the experience of we, we are talking about is also helpful for, for her. We, we all learn from each other um, in these conversations. Yes, absolutely. And um, Paul, I believe, just put the, the link for Thursday night's trivia, um, which will be at uh, 7 or 8 o'clock. I, I missed. So, seven, in, 7 in the morning. 7 in the morning. Start the day with some trivia. <laughs> not, not, for Courtney and, not for Courtney in the West Coast, sorry. Well, we know Courtney will be there at 4 a.m. Um, I see Ellen. I, so well. <laughs> I see Ellen's comment. Um, Ellen, do you do you want uh, just saying that? Uh, I'll just say that you can often do everything right, and it's still hard to retain people and keep momentum going. Not always about doing it right. People are busy and mobile today, which is, I think, certainly true. And I think if I could give one piece of advice, is to <laughs> certainly don't take it personally. Um, I think that's something that, you know, I've had conversations with leaders, like, what are we doing wrong? And often it's, it's just bad timing or, uh, you know, life happens. So definitely uh, be, be proud of the work you're doing. And as Lucia said, stay, stay positive. Um, and I think unless anybody has anything else to add, um, that feels like a really good note to end on. Any final final thoughts or, or comments? Well, thank you so much to uh, Nikhil, of course, Graziella and Lucia. Uh, thank you. Really informative. Um, and uh, thank you all for being part of Kale. Paul, any, any last Kale words before we shut down the final event? <laughs> Trying to unmute myself. No, thank you, everyone. This was a really wonderful program. Um, thank you to Jenna. Thank you to Nick. Of course, to Graciela, uh, Lucia, and Nikhil are all on the Kale subcommittee. So it really, this is all volunteer driven, and we really appreciate all the efforts, and including Courtney, who's on the call too. And if I'm forgetting anyone, thank you, everyone, for all your hard work. So have a wonderful evening, um, and thank you so much. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye.